I spoke yesterday about not needing to be afraid of anything, not fearing those who have the power to kill the physical body and no more. That we are to live before the awesome reality that the God of all authority and power is our Abba Father. We talked about that. That was in Luke chapter 12. And I told you, and we spoke about how we need not be afraid. Now, if you are not afraid, because you have eternity in view, because you have your Father's love in view, that perspective will cause you to look at this temporary life differently. You will want to leverage this temporary life as much as you can for the purposes of eternity. If that's even doable, if there is even a chance that that might be possible, you jump at the opportunity to use your temporary life in such a way that it has eternal significance. It's just reasonable. It's just logical. People who are tied to this temporary world are not going to understand it. And they're probably going to persecute you for it. It's just too weird. But the child of God, if you really believe that God is your father, that you have really nothing to fear regarding this temporary life, you will think and you will see differently. That's the conclusion that Jesus comes to in this part of his teaching. It's chapter 12, verse 32. Again, he says, fear not. Fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Rest assured, God is your father. And as your father, it's his sheer pleasure to give you the eternal kingdom. So sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Jesus says, here's the key to being kingdom-minded. Put your treasure there. Everything you value, ground it in God's kingdom. In heaven, And in his heaven that spreads all across the world. Some examples. One, how about the whole idea of tithing, right? What? Give 10% to church? I'm speaking from a non-believing point of view. What? Give 10% of your income to church? Goodness, for most of us, that's our spending money. And that's true. After you've spent all your money for the necessities, as you've been living paycheck to paycheck, 10% of that, maybe any extra money that you have to spend on yourself, on fun, on dinners out, sure. Some people are lending. (laughs) People who live in debt are lending (laughs) so that they can give 10%. From a point of view where this world is everything, this temporary world is everything, that just doesn't make any sense. Somebody might say, well, Christians in general don't party, so they don't smoke, they don't spend money on drink, and so they have that extra money. No, no, that's not the case. But Christians, not just 10%, they give. They give sometimes out of their poverty, because it makes sense to them. You know, you know, let, me give, let me give you one of my life verses, all right? It's 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The Bible says, this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory 
as we look not to the things which are seen, the temporary things, but to the things that are unseen, the kingdom of God, the fellowship of our brothers and sisters, the opportunity to be of service in that kingdom. The, the, the privilege of living in Christ's likeness to be extensions of his hand and feet. We look to these things that are unseen. Why? For the things which are seen are transient, temporal. But the things which are unseen, these are eternal. It's just logical. We have different priorities. Kingdom priorities are not meant to be understood by people who are bound to this world. And inasmuch as you don't understand that, Maybe your psyche is still too bound to the here and now. Yeah, Christians, their life testimonies are compelling because they think differently. To you, 10% makes sense. You wish you could give more. To you, service to others when they can't pay you back, it makes sense because that's how you store your treasure in heaven. To you, it makes sense that you would give up pieces of this temporary life or this life altogether to show the world that Jesus is more precious than life itself. It makes sense. Nobody puts this in such crystal clarity than the missionary martyrs that have gone before us. Remember, a famous quote, he is no fool, if he should choose to give, to give up what he cannot keep, to gain what he cannot lose. Isn't that good? Kingdom priority talking there. One more. A missionary spends his birthday going to Afghanistan to share the love of Jesus, spends his birthday there, there and ends up being persecuted and killed. That's magnificent enough but back home, where his wife and child were, were, listen to the way his wife explained daddy's death. When her child asked what happened to daddy, after thinking about it, she said to her, daddy, received the greatest gift from God that he could ever receive on his birthday. And that's how she explained Daddy's giving up his life for King Jesus. And it is said that, that for that kid, with that childlike faith, that explanation made sense, found its way home. Isn't that good? Yeah. Yeah. To the people of the world, that kind of sacrificial life, that kind of calculus doesn't make any sense. But to you and me, in the light of the fact that you and I are children of God, that the only one that anybody has ultimate reason to fear loves us unconditionally, unfathomably. To us, it makes sense. It's just reasonable. I pray that you would live this bold, reasonable life, that you would make decisions in life with kingdom priorities in mind. God may call you to lives that look very, very unconventional and very uncomfortable to the watching world. But that's okay. The Lord calls you to it, then it's worthwhile to display that Jesus is absolutely worth it. Rather, it's a shame that we can't give more. Let that be our testimony for the fame of Jesus' beautiful name. Let's pray. For the fame of your beautiful name, many people have laid down their lives following in your footsteps as you laid down your life for the Heavenly Father and on our behalf. Oh, you are so beautiful. Your grace is so magnificent. 
our being in your family makes it so that we have priorities that are not going to make sense to the watching world. And that's why, that's why our testimony you teach us will be compelling when we love the unlovable and we love each other unreasonably. It will be compelling because it will hit home to those who see that that was, that was what they were made for. They were not made bound for this, this life, but for the life to come, for life in your kingdom, in your home. May we live all of our lives with these kingdom priorities, spiritual eyes wide open, seeing you clearly for the beauty that you are. Holy Spirit, do this in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, Mr.
Christmas.